Thanks to the military and political success of major Kushana rulers like Kujula Katfaisis, Vema Katfaisis, Kanishka I, Vashishka, Kanishka II, Huvishka, Vasudeva, Kanishka III, Vasudeva II, the Kushanas could dominate a very large area, including major portions of North India for nearly 250 years. We have to keep in mind that the rise of the Kushanas, like its fall, is intimately linked up with Bactria. The loss of Bactria in the hands of the Sassanid ruler Shapur I in 262 AD spelt the death blow to the Kushana power, which gradually then made the exit. And after 265, there is hardly any Kushana political presence in the mainland of the subcontinent. While the Kushana power was on the rise for the first time in the history of the subcontinent, the Deccan, the peninsular part of India, also began to make its presence felt and gained considerable visibility in political history. The main focus for the political history of the Deccan in this period are two houses, mainly the Satavahanas in the Deccan and to some extent the Shaka house in Gujarat and Western India. We have already talked about the presence of the Shakas in Gujarat and Western India. So now we can pay our attention to the dynastical Satavahanas. For the first time, peninsular India experienced monarchical polity with the emergence of the Satavahanas. The Satavahanas are known from their own inscriptions from a very large variety of coins they issued. They are also mentioned in the Puranas but under a different name. In the Puranas they are called the Andras or Andra Vrityas. It is significant to note that the inscriptions never call them Andra Vrityas or Andras and the Puranas never call them Satavahanas. The list of kings in the Puranas are pretty large. Nearly about 30 rulers have been mentioned, yet in the inscriptions only 19 rulers are mentioned in the, as kings of Satavahana dynasty. Comparing the two, it appears that it is better to stick to the names common in both the inscriptions and the Puranic lists and therefore the actual number of rulers who ruled the Satavahana realm do not exceed the number of 19 or 20. The Satavahanas possibly came into prominence from the late 1st century BC. Their experience of a monarchical polity is first seen in the case of the Satavahanas, but it is not a sudden experience. The Rathis and the Bhojas already encountered in the Ashokan inscriptions become in the post Mauryan inscriptions Maharathikas, Mahabhojas. From Bhattipralu in eastern Deccan, we come across a chief called Kubiraka. Bidhi Chattopadhyay very cogently argues that this is a gradual, a very slow process of transition from a pre-monarchical polity gradually to a full-fledged monarchical polity. The monarchical polity definitely appeared with the coming of the Satavahanas, but the ground was getting ready even in the pre-Satavahana phase, particularly when we see the issuance of coins First, uninscribed coins, then the inscribed coins. 
once again following B.D. Chattopadhyay, we may find here that those coins indicated the existence of localities under chieftaincies that would correspond to the experience of the Janapadas in North India before the 6th century BC. It is in this background that one has to appreciate the emergence, foundation, consolidation of the Satavahana rule. Where did the Satavahanas really rise from? Their Puranic name Andhra often leads scholars to believe that they hailed from Eastern Deccan. This is questionable because the earliest of the Satavahana inscriptions are all coming from Western Deccan like Nasik, like Karla, Junnar, the area around Nevasa which is in the Ahmednagar district of Maharashtra. Their capital was located at Pratishthan which is present day Paitan in Aurangabad district. So, the earliest rulers and their records and their activities are more associated with western and central Deccan rather than the eastern part of Deccan which is present day Andhra Pradesh area. The rise of the Satavahanas is possibly from the area around Nasik, Nevasa and Pratishthan region in Aurangabad district. When did they begin to rule? This is in fact also a problematic in the Deccan history. Earlier scholars around 1940s, 1950s believed largely by accepting the Puranic descriptions that the Andhras were originally a part of the Mauryan realm under Ashoka. Then soon after the dissolution of the Mauryan empire, they began to be independent. So, their existence was from the late 3rd century BC. There is little doubt that the Satavahanas were in political existence at least up to 225 AD. So, the earlier scholars believed that the Satavahanas were in the political scene for nearly 450 years, a very long chronology. This is now revised in the light of the present scholarly opinion of relying more on the list of 19 or 20 rulers common both to the inscriptions and Puranic lists. It is also to be seen that the earliest Satavahana inscriptions as you have said from Nasik, from Nevasa would indicate that the paleography of the inscriptions that is the dating of the uh, alphabets, the, the, the script of the inscription cannot be prior to late 1st century BC. We may also recall that one of the very early Satavahana rulers named Satakarni already figured in Kharavela's inscription. If Kharavela belonged to the late 1st century BC, his contemporary Satakarni an, an early Satavahana ruler cannot belong to 2nd or 3rd century BC. So, it is more cogent to locate them chronologically in and around the second half of the 1st century BC and their existence, political existence continued up to 225 AD. So, the entire range is for about 275-280 years of political existence. The earliest ruler of the Satavahana dynasty according to both Puranic list and inscriptions was one Simuka or Shishuka. He is possibly the same as the King Satavahana whose name appears in a coin found from the excavation at Nevasa in Ahmednagar district. Excavated material gives us a better chronological position and once again this ruler appears to have been 
uh, in power around late 1st century BC. The earliest inscriptions from Nanaghat, from Nasik, of the two early rulers like Simuka and Krishna the first would indicate that they rose from western central Deccan with their capital at Pratishthan or Paitan during the time of Satakarni, who is already mentioned by Karavela. He is known as also Satakarni the first. There will be many Satakarnis later. So, he is Satakarni the first. His name figures in an inscription from Sanchi in eastern Malwa. This could indicate, though it may not prove conclusively, that he possibly made a conquest in the eastern Malwa region, though it cannot be conclusively proved. So, already the Satavahana power is growing. At this point, the Satavahana rise in the western central Deccan is thwarted by a stiff political challenge from the Saka adversary. His name is Kshatrapa Nahopana. Kshatrapa Nahopana is known like the Satavahana rulers from inscriptions and from his coins. It appears from the list of inscriptions that Nahopana's inscriptions came up from Nasik, from Junnar, from Karla. All these areas had earlier been under Sat Satavahana occupation. So, obviously, the Shaka ruler rose at the cost of the Satavahana power in this area. Similarly, his inscriptions indicate that he was in occupation over area called Dashapura that is Mandasore and area around Ujjaini, area around Prabhasa which is in Kathiawar Peninsula. It shows how the rival house of the Shakas under Nahopana's energetic and powerful military rule was growing and offering a major challenge to the rise of the Satavahanas. The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea written by an anonymous author in the late 1st century AD speaks vividly of the situation in coastal western India. The Greek author indicated that Nahopana in his language Nambanus or Mambanus put a blockade on the port of Kaliane. This Kaliane is nothing but our well known Kalyan, a suburb of present day Mumbai, which was at that time a well known port. The port was blockaded by Nambanus or Nahopana and he forced visiting ships to go to his own port, Barugaza or Brigukacha, that is, Broach, on the mouth of the Narmada. This is how politics and long distance commerce got intertwined in the course of political rivalry to put pressure on the Satavahanas. Nahopana tried what in present day term could be indicated as a naval blockade to put economic blockade on the rival sport. Kalyan actually died down for a long period of time after the first century AD. Now, at this point, the Satavahanas definitely were in a difficult scenario. This is the first phase of the Shaka Satavahana rivalry. The tables turned with the arrival of Gautami Putra Satakarni, the greatest of the Satavahana rulers, who ruled possibly from 106 AD to about 130 AD. He is best known in the form of a prashasti or an eulogistic inscription which was mentioning his mother Gautami Balasri, that is why he is known as Gautami Putra and his widespread conquests figure in a panegyrical manner in this Prakrit inscription. It is categorically stated therein that Gautami Putra Satakarni established the fame and glory of his family that is the Satavahana family by exterminating the 
Shaka Shaharat family. This is the dynasty to which Nahopana belonged. First, this is a clear statement of Gautam Putra Satakarni's victory over his Shaka rival. The best corroborative evidence comes in the form of thousands of Nahopana's coins found from Jogal Thimbi hoard near Nasik. These coins were restruck, overstruck by the legends and motives of Gautam Putra Satavahana's coins. This is a very clear indication how the Satavahana ruler now defeated his shaka rival. In the graphic details of this Nasik Prashasti, Gautam Putra Satakarni is credited with widespread conquest of areas not merely located in Maharashtra, but in areas to the north of Maharashtra, like the area of Aparanta, which is Konkan coastal area, the area of uh, Mahishmati, which is Mandhata to the south of the Narmada, then the area of Akara and Avanti. Avanti is the Ujjani region and Akara is the eastern Malwa region. He is the first Satavahana ruler to have conquered the eastern Deccan area, that is the Andhra coastal area lying between the Godavari delta and the Krishna delta. He is eulogistically described as one whose chargers, that is cavalry, drank the waters of the three seas, that is Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal and perhaps even the Indian Ocean. That might suggest that his army reached the three extreme coastal areas. There may be a typical court poetical exaggeration in this account, but his control over the west coast and also the east coast in the Deccan is beyond any doubt. He is also known to have been uh, the master of the region around uh, Vijayadurg in the uh, Karwar point area, once again a coastal area. This is a very powerful ruler who fittingly assumed the title Dakshinapathapati, the Lord of the Deccan. The Satavahanas really at this time were the Lord of the Deccan. At the height of the Satavahana power, once again came another stiff challenge from the Shakas, but this time from a different branch of the Shakas. If the first resistance came from the Kshaharata family, now the challenge came from another line of the Shakas called the Kardamaka house. This was based essentially in Kathiawar area and Ujjaini. This ruler is known as Rudradaman the first. He first appears in an inscription from Andhau as a conjoint ruler, as a junior co-ruler with his senior co-ruler, his grandfather Chashtana in 130 AD. By 150 AD, his Junagadh rock inscription, a prashasti, in fact, the first prashasti written in high-flown court poetical Sanskrit is belongs to him, Rudradaman the first, dated in Shakoera 72, that is 150 AD. It records how Rudradaman conquered areas which were in fact had earlier been conquered by Gautami Putra Satakarni, like Aparanta, like Maishmati, like the region of Onupa, which is the region of Mahishmati, the region around Akara and Avanti, that is Ujjaini region and Eastern Malwa around Vidisha. There are certain common areas which were coveted by both the warring sides, coveted both by the Shakas and the Satavahanas. We will come back to this point later, but we can also indicate that the Kathiawar Peninsula, where from Junagar is located, very much part of Rudradaman's area, 
he is a very powerful ruler and he categorically mentions in his record that he defeated the Satakarni, obviously a Satavahana ruler, not once but twice. But being magnanimous, he spared him on account of nearness of relation. There are other sources in which I am not going into the details of. There are indications that the Satavahanas and Rudradaman had earlier entered into a marriage alliance contract. Therefore, this is the basis of the nearness of relation. He defeated the Dakshinapatapati, the Lord of Dakshinapata, Satakarni twice, but spared him on account of his nearness of relation with the Satakarni, that is the Satavahana ruler. This is the third phase. And once again, the Satavahanas were in a distress scenario. The territories of the Satavahanas are beyond the Narmada in Gujarat and in Avanti, in uh, eastern Malwa, definitely were lost because of the rise of this very powerful Shaka king. Who this uh, Satavahana ruler was? who was defeated twice by his Shaka adversary is difficult to ascertain. It could be Gautami Putra himself that would indicate his victories were very short lived. It could have been Gautami Putra's immediate successor Sri Pulumavi who is who was known in Ptolemy's geography as Siropolemaios. Sri Pulumavi, Vashishti Putra Pulumavi was a powerful ruler whose inscriptions have come from Nasik from Western Deccan, the capital remained intact in, in Pratishthan and he was definitely in command over eastern part of Deccan because a very special type of coin showing ships on Satavahana coins were specifically minted and circulated in eastern Deccan area. This ruler could have been the adversary who could have been defeated by the Shaka king. The other possible third possibility is Vashishtiputra Satakarni who is then another Satavahana ruler who could have been also a contemporary of Rudradaman and could have been defeated by him. After this the last known great Satavahana ruler, the real powerful Satavahana ruler was one Yajnasri Satakarni who was able to get back the area of Nasik and western Deccan from the Shaka adversary. So, this is the last phase after which the Satavahanas gradually began to decline and fade out. There are some lesser known later Satavahana rulers. With the waning of their power, the Satavahanas began to lose their control over their traditional stronghold area that is the area of western central Deccan. They actually now became established in eastern Deccan actually the Andhra area and also in the Bellary district of Karnataka. These were the last two areas held by the Satavahanas in the very last phase of their rule that is by about the last 50 years or 25 years of their rule. By 225 AD, the last vestiges of Satavahana rule in uh, Eastern Deccan are gone. They are replaced there by a new dynasty, Ikshwakas. Four Ikshwaka rulers ruled from Vijayapuri, that is present Nagarjunakonda area in Andhra Pradesh, uh, from 225 AD to 325 AD. There were many other smaller powers gradually rising on the ruins of the Satavahana realm. But by 225 AD, the Satavahana existence is wiped out from the history of the Deccan. What was happening even in the far south? After all, Dakshinapata area is differentiated from Dravida Desha, the far south that is the area watered uh, by the river Kaveri, Vaigai, in, in the far south area. This is the Tamilakam area which is known to us 
through the earliest Tamil poems, the Sangam literature. It is very difficult to date this text, but possibly assigned between 200 BC and 300 AD. The main theme of these uh, poems in Tamil language is the, the praise of heroes in battles. There are, unlike the situation in North India and the Deccan, hardly a regularly established monarchical polity. There are many chieftains and small clans which are dominating different areas of Tamilakam. Three clans or chieftaincies were outstanding. The Cholas who were in the Kaveri Basin and Kaveri Delta, the Pandyas who were in the Vaigai Basin and Vaigai Delta particularly around Madurai and the Cheras who were also in the western part of the Kaveri uh, Valley with their capital at Karur. Now these three clans are known as the Vendar or Ventar in the classical Sangam text because they were outstanding clans and outshining all other contemporary clans. The Sangam literature is full of accounts of the heroic exploits of many of the chieftains, particularly belonging to these three major uh, groups, the Cholas, the Cheras, the Pandyas. Two figures should be mentioned here, Nedun Jeral of the Chera house and Karikal of the Chola area. These are two outstanding political personalities figuring in the Sangam literature. And interestingly, all these three major chieftaincies were located in areas which were agriculturally prosperous and at least the Cholas and the, che and, and the Pandyas had access to the coastal area. The agricultural fertile tract figures in the Sangam texts as Marudam and the coastal tracts are known as the Naidal area. The power pockets are typically associated with two vital tracts in the Tamilakam. But the Tamilakam presents a different political scenario. There is at, as yet no full-fledged monarchical setup in this area. It is still dominated by chieftaincies, the like of which we had seen, according to Romila Thapar, in North Indian condition before the days of the Mahajanapadas.